Welcome to all our support fibro friends. I'm thrilled to bring you our latest interview. We have a very special guest with Dr. Olga Pinkston. She is a board certified rheumatologist with her practice based in Kentucky. She works with patients living with rheumatic and autoimmune conditions. And most importantly, she does work with fibromyalgia patients. She has a wonderful podcast called Mind Your Fibro Podcast, where I first connected with her and learned about all her wonderful work. Welcome Dr. Pinkston to the support fibro fibromyalgia community. Thank you so much, Melissa, for inviting me. I know it's been in the works for months and months, but I'm so glad to be here. And thank you for all the work you do for the Support Fibromyalgia Network. I think it's phenomenal and so needed. Well, we appreciate it. And we want to really bring the community together, including our providers and rally around you and say that you're very much supported. So we always look forward to seeing uh, and connecting with caring doctors. And I'm looking forward to having you speak at our conference. So everybody get ready for that on November 4th and 5th. Uh, Dr. Pinkston will join us at the Fibromyalgia Community Conference. Um, but let's get started with some questions because I've seen your recent workshops and if anyone out there has actually attended the workshops too, please chime in, say hello, let us know that you enjoy them because a lot of great information on the nervous system. I nerded out with you, which yeah. I caught in your opening that you have a kind of a nerdy background, which resonated with me. So let's share a little bit about your backstory and medicine and then what kind of piques your interest in fibromyalgia. So my story is a little has a little twisted, you know, turns and and it's it's being a long journey to become a physician. I remember my, I grew up in Soviet Union and I came to U.S. about thirty years ago, and my mom and my grandmother were both physicians in Soviet Union. Um, so I first saw my mom work in the clinic when I was six years old, and I knew like this is like it was an aha moment for me. I remember as I was six. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. You know, I was lucky because most people, most children don't have this, this passion. And when I saw what my mom did, I was like, this is this is it. This is what I want. So when I was uh, in high school in, in Uzbekistan, I was actually a pre-med. And I went through the pre-med uh, you know, enrollment and I was getting ready to go to medical school in, in Uzbekistan. When my parents immigrated, uh, the whole family came as refugees from Uzbekistan to, to America. And I had to redo my whole plan of my life. So I didn't speak English. I was 16. You know, so there was a, it was interesting because my parents said, well, I don't think you can do medicine in the U.S. You know, you don't speak English. You can't go to medical school. It's so competitive. So they said, well, Russians can do math. Go do some engineering. So this is why how I ended up be, being an engineer, computer science major, uh, computer engineering major at a local uh, uh, school of engineering, because I thought, well, in, you know, computers and art, I was artistic, really go well together. Of, of course, we didn't have an art, computer art degree at the time. It was, you know, it was in the 90s. And so I was like, well, might as well do engineering and then I'll, I'll find my way. But the nagging thought is, is I should be a doctor was there every single semester. So I will go to my, you know, college counselor and say, you know, I want to be a doctor. Why would you bother? This is, this is impossible. You have IT degree. This is year 2000 now. It's like, this is the hardest degree, you know, the, the engineering, the computers. What are you talking about? So, you know, everybody would talk me out of even thinking about medicine. And I, I thought, well, maybe college is not for me. I will graduate and I'll enjoy my work because I really want to be with humans, not just computers in the computers. So I got my degree and I went to work. And every job I had, I was successful because I... You know, if you're smart and you apply yourself and work hard, you can be successful. But the nagging de desire to be a doctor was always there. So my finally, my job got outsourced to India, and as many jobs did. And in 2004, 2003, I lost my job, and I was like, "This is it. It's either now or never. I can be a miserable programmer by 40, or I can do it. I can be a doctor." So with my support of my husband, uh, who's also a programmer. I started my journey to become a physician. I had to do uh, pre-medical classes first, take my exam, go into medical school, applied. Hallelujah, I got accepted on the first try. And you know that was my plan. I had no plan of what kind of physician I wanted to be yet, probably primary care, because that's what my mom did. But, and I was also wanted to, to help patients. Like I wanted to be that kind of country doctor, you know, Dr. Queen Medi medicine woman, you know, who spends time with patients, who talks to patients. That was my kind of ideal, you know, what, you know, I was still a young person, you know, and so when I went to medical school, 
And then I decided to become internal medicine physician. Every year I would actually meet a person who had autoimmune, autoimmune condition. And every year was lupus. The first, I was an intern, then I was the second year, third year. And those patients were so complicated. Their stories were so, you know, the conditions were so severe and the treatment they needed were so variable. And, but I also found that in our university, we did not have rheumatology department. So we, we didn't even have a rheumatologist on staff when I was an intern to help those patients. We had to get in some emergency privileges to local rheumatologists to come to see this patient who almost died from lupus. So every year it was like a, like a knock on the door, like rheumatology, rheumatology, rheumatology. But I didn't have exposure. And at that time I had three young children. So for me, traveling somewhere to become a rheumatologist was kind of out of the question. I was like, you know, I, I already put my kids and my husband through medical school and in you know, residency. And I felt like uprooting them out of the city and grandparents was kind of harsh. So I decided, well, internal medicine is, is it. I'll be a hospital doctor. It's complex. I can save lives. It's interesting. And then my third year of residency, we had actually rheumatologist, uh, rheumatology department now. And I met this wonderful rheumatologist, Dr. Runika Ravenel, and she opened up this possibility. I was like, listen, this is the best field ever. This is the rheumatologists are the happiest, smartest, the most caring physicians ever. And you should be one. And I was about three months to graduation. And I was like, okay, I'm sold. I came home to my husband and I said, listen, I want to be a rheumatologist. He's like, well, you know, what else? You know, we already went through so many different things and so many different paths, you know, pathways and changes. So he said, okay, well, you know, what do you want to do? I was like, well, I don't think I should stay in Louisville, you know, for this, you know, uh, we don't have a, this is a new program. And I really want to, you know, if I, if I want to be a rheumatologist, I want to, I want to be the best rheumatologist I can be. So I applied to best schools. I was interviewed at many, many colleges. I went to see the world. I applied only, <laughs> excuse me, south of, of Louisville because I'm, I'm, I don't like cold. Okay. So I applied everything south of Louisville, you know, the Duke, you know, the Emory. And then I got into a Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville and I fell in love with the program. And they only take one person a year to, 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 for training. And it was late. I was like, this is what I want to do. And, you know, it happened. I got matched. And my, my family spent two years in Jacksonville. It was the best experience ever. It just it was just a, it was a blessing. My kids got to spend time in the ocean in a decent world. I didn't feel guilty uprooting them for two years. It was like it was like it was like two year vacation for us. And I got to spend time at Rochester Mayo Clinic in Rochester in, in Jacksonville, working with wonderful physicians, the smartest people in the industry. And that's when I was actually first introduced to fibromyalgia. You know, I, I was already a physician. I, already, I, I spent you know, three years as a resident. Then I was worked as a hospice for a year. And only then in, in my fellowship, I was introduced properly to the fibromyalgia patient and learned what it was. And then they had a clinic for fibromyalgia patients that actually uh, is world famous clinic for fibro and program, and program at, at Mayo Clinic. And it's, when I went through this training as a physician, but I was there as a patient kind of looking from the inside because I did not have the knowledge. So I was kind of observer role. I not only saw the teachings and the learnings, but the patients who come in and they have a two day program and they have a three day program, a three week program in a three week program. I spent there for three weeks going with patients every, every, it was Monday through Friday for three weeks. And I sat there and I saw their transformation, how they, I saw their fears. I saw how much impact it made on their lives. I saw the pain, the fatigue, and all the tools that Mayo Clinic provided them to help them themselves, because they teach you how to be your own provider, how to apply that knowledge. And in three weeks, some people made no progress and some people made remarkable progress. You know, they walked in with the little, you know, little walkers and walked out, you know, without them. But their mindset, the mindset shift that patients, that I've seen patients make, and I made with them when I saw them make this transformation was remarkable. I also saw their, their have a support Saturdays when the families come, the caregivers come, and they get uh, to be educated on pharmacology from the caretaker's perspective. And it was eye-opening because I did not realize that having a condition of like pharmacology does not affect just the patient, it affects the whole community, their job, the people around them, the family, 
their relationships, their children, how they function in the world. So for me, the three weeks was really like, you know, explosion of, of the knowledge, but also it kind of gave me a different perspective on compassion towards the patient. Because I feel like sometimes physicians, when we see chronic pain or fibromyalgia, we, 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 we freeze. We don't know what to do. And it comes off sometimes as we don't care or we don't, you know, we don't know what how to help. But in, I think in reality is there's little we can do in 20 minutes. And then when we see this complex patient and we don't know what to do, we come off as that we don't care. And so that shifts, shifted in perspective. Like, yes, we can come up as a, you know, come off as we care. And we can actually have the tools and have treatments that are effective for the patients. So I stopped being afraid of fibro patients when I came, <laughs> when I become a rheumatologist. You know, when I saw a patient with fibromyalgia on my on my, on my schedule, I I welcomed it because that was my opportunity to talk to the patient, educate the patient, give them hope, provide knowledge. And then if even if I didn't keep them as a provider, I showed them, you know, that this is not at the end of the world and that they're not crazy. This is a real disease. Fibromyalgia is real. If Mayo Clinic treats you for three weeks and tells you it's real, it is real. If they have a program since the 70s, before they, uh, before the uh, World Health Organization recognized fibromyalgia as a condition, it must be real. Right. And I tell you, you, there's no conspiracy on the internet. You all don't conspire with each other, with the symptoms and the feelings and, and all the, you know, it is a real condition. And so I get really upset when I feel, uh, when some physicians or other providers, you know, oh, you have fibromyalgia and some quotations. How negating it is for the patient to feel that. So the more I worked as a rheumatologist, the more experience I got, the more knowledge I got, the more it became, you know, more of a, it, it became like my second passion. I would say rheumatology is my first passion. I love rheumatology. But now fibromyalgia is, is my second uh, passion because I know there's things patients can get and, and they can also uh, feel better. And it's not the end of the world. There's hope. And, you yeah. know. There is hope and what an incredible journey. I appreciate you sharing with us so much. I mean, just living out your dream too and inspiring others to do the same. And then just the coordination. Although I found that some of the people with engineering or computer science backgrounds have some of the best understanding of biology because your system, right, needs that upgrade. So how you're processing information is so wonderful. And what what an incredible journey of perseverance and I'm so glad you've been able to find that passion and you were able to persevere to achieve that passion. And you've continued to learn too. And the complexities of like, you mentioned lupus, which has uh, so many complexities. And we have a lot of friends here from Looms for Lupus and other lupus communities. We've somehow come together. I think there's a lot of overlap with fibromyalgia or in their family systems and then getting involved with more training. Um, I, I'm really impressed, but I, I'm just congratulations on everything that you've been doing. And I mean, we, we're so happy to have you here to shine a light on all that wonderful work. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I agree. I think computer engineering and and STEM mathematics. Uh, I think it's so important for you know for people, but especially for girls, to get involved in mathematics because it opens opportunities that are closed, maybe closed otherwise. You know, I was computer major, you know, and computer engineering major, but I took a lot of classes in, in mathematics. It made my brain think differently. It made me think. Uh, in systems, as you said, you know, in algorithms, you know, when I, I'm faced with a patient with a dilemma, I can I can think logically, I can absorb a lot of data, analyze it, and you know, dismiss some data, you know, some data, incorporate it, look for more data. So, but also we have a lot of computer systems now in in this world. You know, you know, if you think of medic medicine, it's exploded in the past excuse me, 50, 60 years. We see a lot of more testing, you know, imaging medications, you know, how they work. It's all biochemistry or, you know, it's all now on the on molecular level. You know, th that's, a, that's a lot of integration that we, we as physicians have to uh, learn, use, and able to explain to the patients like, hey, this medication, yes, it has side effects. Yes, it's chemotherapy, but it works on the molecules that you need to, to you know, to fix because this is an abnormal pathway. So when I like Rheumatology is because of that, all those pathways and all the analysis and all the complexities are there for me to learn. 
I, I am on the same page. I agree with uh, women in science and just exploring and how we can support each other. As a child, I, I definitely, science and math and medicine were huge for me at a younger age, just reading that and how to explore and support other women. And even women in rheumatology, I've heard that we've rheumatologists, we need more rheumatologists in the field. So, and then other women that understand, and especially in the fibromyalgia community as well, and having that empathy, women of color, we've explored that too. So it, it's a lot of these systemic changes that we are looking forward to making. And we're, we're glad that we can join forces and do this together. Uh, yes, I agree. You know, in, in, in Louisville, Kentucky, we actually have a women in rheumatology group, all the female physicians for rheumatologists. We will have a journal club. We get together, we talk. There's no competition. There, and there's just a, such a friendly place to share ideas and be supported. You know, some of them are, you know, older, they've been in business for a long time, they give us ideas, some are just, just graduated. So I think women need that support, regardless of industry, regardless if it's STEM or rheumatology or any kind of profession. So I, I feel like, you know, I, I appreciate you supporting providers who, who treat fibromyalgia, but also patients with fibromyalgia. A lot of women have fibromyalgia and they're caretakers, they're mothers, they're workers, the teachers, the doctors, the, the nurses, they are, they have to juggle many balls in the air at the same time. And if you have the fibromyalgia symptoms, the fatigue, the brain fog, the exhaustion, the pain, and also having the symptoms that are unpredictable, that makes life so complicated. So when I see a patient now in the clinic and she has young children, she has fibromyalgia or she has rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia or something else, to me, I see this mother who has to feel better to care for the family, who has to, she has to care for her children. She, she cannot take off a day you know, to sleep in the bed because she has three young children. So we, we have to find solutions that are easy to implement, that are supportive and uh, that are available. Because you know the availability now is is an issue. We don't have enough rheumatologists, and we don't have enough people who support fibromyalgia. So, I think you're doing a great job doing that. So, filling that gap that's really needed. Well, that's what we started the organization with. Actually, Brandy from Being Fibro Mom, who has fibromyalgia, has kids, and is raising and trying to figure out how to thrive while living with fibromyalgia and raising a family. So that's a big theme. So it was good to have her bring in. She's also a Navy veteran. So we kind of joined fo forces to build this, and the idea was to fill in the gaps. But we're finding there's some pretty large gaps in the fibromyalgia community, and there's a lot of work to do. So that's why we we need to provide. And I think to come together because we've lost a little bit of the communication. And I just think maybe with the other medical systems or how fibromyalgia was taught in the past. So we want to reinvent this and just bring us all together to communicate and then also train other medical providers too. So like you mentioned, there's different ways of how they describe fibromyalgia um, and how we can make those changes to make it more effective. And it, eventually it's just about making patients feel Feel better in the end, which I know that's why people got into medicine. We want our patients to feel better. So, absolutely. And, and you know, interestingly, I have a lot of nurse practitioners, physicians, uh, physical therapists, other healthcare pr providers who listen to my podcast. And they, they mail me, email me and say, Hey, thank you for the podcast. I had no idea what fiber was and what we can, you know, do and help. So even though my podcast was, in, you know, uh, created for, for my own patients, now it's being listened to everywhere else, I, the providers are looking for that support and that knowledge. So I think, you know, it's, it's becoming more, people, I think, becoming more aware of chronic pain and the opportunities to treat it, especially now that we don't use opiates as much and it became, there's no crutch, you know, we can't just have, here's a pill, you know, good luck. Now we have to be more creative in treating chronic pain. And I feel like we are on the right path now, you know, go going forward. I mean, we're still in infancy, but I feel like in the next, uh, hopefully, you know, not, not too long from now, we'll have more answers and more opportunities to learn and to apply it. 
I love that. That gets me all energized with the movement forward because that's a huge goal of ours, of what we originally kind of had started in our heads, but we've slowly been working towards it. Advocacy Day has kind of been a move we didn't expect, but trying to get our federal government more invested in fibromyalgia, but we still have to do the grassroots work of getting the patients involved, getting the providers involved. So that's part of the next step. Now, with your podcast, which is you you mentioned it and you're having patients listen, providers listen. That's so exciting for you. But I'm learning as we talk that you've created this podcast. So it's you. It's you editing. Um, what got you inspired to actually launch the podcast? So I was at Mayo Clinic and I graduated and I came to Kentucky and there's no Mayo Clinic. So at Mayo Clinic as a rheumatologist, I, I, it was it was wonderful because I saw patients in, in my rheumatology clinic and I said, listen, you have fibromyalgia. Congratulations. It's a blessing. We have the clinic here to help you, support you. And all it took me, just an order in the computer system and off the went. Well, you know, I came to Kentucky. There's no, there's no order for fibromyalgia clinic. I have to either tell them that I'm sorry you have fibromyalgia, but we, we don't keep you in our clinic, in the rheumatology clinic, because we don't have the space. We graduate you to primary care or to a pain management, whoever you know you decide, but we only I we're only able to provide care to patients who have rheumatology conditions, autoimmune conditions, who may or may, may not have fibromyalgia. It's just there's such a shortage of rheumatologists in Kentucky. Our wait list is six to nine months to see us for the as a new patient. So if we open all all the access to everybody, you know, to every disease, every condition, we will not be able to provide the care to patients who, who cannot get care from anybody else. So if you have lupus, no one else can care for you. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, no one, no one, no one else can care, care for you. So we made a decision as a group that we do not treat osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, and fibromyalgia because other providers, other professionals can help you with that. And we are focusing on the very sickest patients. We actually take every insurance plan in Kentucky. So we are the university, you know, patient, uninsured or, you know, uh, patient. And, and we have patients travel, you know, three, six hours from the tri-state area to see us. So it wasn't because we didn't care about the patients. It's just the logistics were not there. So when I, you know, graduated and came to my practice, I said, well, you have fibromyalgia and go to primary care. And then we'll come back three months later. Well, they didn't do anything, you know? And I was like, well, you know, this is what what the life is. And, and so after multiple years of doing this, it just became, again, uh, I became more aware of frustration that I had with that. So I, I became a life coach uh, myself to help me lose weight for, after having a baby in my 40s. And I was starting, you know, realize that I get this anxiety and frustration when I see a patient that I cannot help. And, you know, I know that your thoughts create your feelings, create your actions. Well, I didn't have an action. Like all I could do is just, you know, send them off to primary care. So I, I, I realized that for me to feel better as a physician, I had to have I have to have some tools that I can provide them. And I could not find the the material that was easy to understand, that was on the go, that was not a book, because people will say, Oh, I'm reading a book, I'm falling asleep. I actually tried to do a blog first. And people, you know, the patients will tell me it was interesting, but I fell asleep by, by second page. The brain fog, you know, I had to underline and, you know, I just couldn't understand it. And, and I had fear of public speaking and I'm an introvert. It took me a long time to get out of my comfort zone to get into the microphone and to become interviewed, to, to have a podcast. So I worked with the, as I was getting my coaching um, certification, I actually had my the, the coach uh, students, uh, the my classmates coach me on my fear of public speaking. Why I should, the, I, I told them I will never have a podcast. I speak too fast. I have an accent. I'm afraid of public speaking. I will never do it. So it took them, I had to be coached on that to say, okay, you can do it, do it already. <laughs> And then, well, thank you to those people that coached you because we yes, love the information. But it was a mind shift, uh, mind shift change for me with coaching. And I, I read somewhere or I heard something is the, the longer I don't do it, more people suffer. You know, my fears about public speaking or whatever insecurities I had prevented somebody else feeling better. And when I kind of re rethought that that fear, it I realized, listen, my fears versus their pain is not comparable. You know, get off your get off your fear insecurities and get it done because somebody needs it. 
And that was my drive to get to make it to make it happen. And I could not start for a couple of months because I didn't have the name. I was hung up on the name. So I have to actually, you know, it's like almost like a, a composer with a song. I had to have my my song before I had I, I could have the lyrics. So I, I got, came up with the name. Uh, and then I started, you know, uh, recording it, you know, writing it. But I wanted to make the podcast as a self-help guide for my patients. So when I see a patient in my clinic and I tell them, you have fibromyalgia, and this is this is great news. You don't have, you know, horrible conditions. This is doable. This is You have hope. You can treat yourself. And here's how. That was my goal for the podcast. You can go through each episode and understand what is fibromyalgia. How is it diagnosed? What are the doctors, you know, what are they doing, not doing? So you understand and can advocate for yourself. What are the symptoms? You know, what are what are things you can do for yourself now while you're waiting to be treated by your other by your providers? And also our our society is so focused on a approach to treatment with the pills. You have fibromyalgia, here's Cymbalta. You know, I'm so sorry, here's Gabapentin or Lyrica. And I find that this is a wrong approach for many patients because yes, they those medications can help you with manage some of your symptoms, but fibromyalgia is not flu. It's not it's not a cold. It's not pneumonia. You know, you don't get better after taking antibiotic course or you know, it is a lifelong condition that can be treated successfully when you combine the mind, uh, body, mind work, mindset, you know, uh, schedule, you know, self care you know, sleeping patterns improvement, you know, diet improvement, exercise improvement, but you have to really combine many things, many moving things to feel better. And it's not just like, okay, here's a pill, you know, good luck. You know, the the side effects, you know, some medications help patients dramatically. I have patients who swear by Cymbalta. So I use those medications, but it's often not enough. So the podcast was the guide to my patients that I can treat with medications or primary care can treat with medications or the physical therapy can treat with you know, physical therapy, but they needed more of other things they can do on their own, how they can mine their own fiber. And that's how the podcast came about. And this is the format of the podcast. You know, what is fiber, how it's diagnosed, how it's treated, self-care is important. So I have a self-care episode. Then it goes into a brain of f- stress connection, a pain, a pain and uh, fear, and then goes into other things you can do for yourself, including meditation, diet, nutrition, exercise, and whatnot. So this is what the, the goal of the podcast is to have uh, it's a resource for patients to apply to themselves on in, in, and be on, on their own schedule. This is great because you've created a solution. So you are looking for ways to provide more education. I mean, based on the circumstances that were happening, but you created a solution not only for maybe some of the primary care to listen in, but the patients to really empower themselves and understand it's multiple modalities. Like you can't rely on monotherapy, which is what we've been used to for so long, but there's multiple things that you can do at home. And as a coach, I love this because it's, you know, you talk about nutrition, you get into sleep, gut health, nervous system. You just did an entire wonderful workshop on the nervous system. So you've really created these solutions and resources for patients to grab onto, and they can even take this and share with their providers. So it's something that filled, and that's why I got excited because I'm listening, and you're now starting to do interviews with other people. How does that feel added into the podcast? You know, I, I'm choosy of who I'm inviting because I really want to not dilute the message for the patients. So I'm I'm picking and choosing topics that I feel that are important for the patients to hear and that I don't have expertise in. I'm not an exerciser, I don't sport. <laughs> so I have a, a friend of mine who did a three uh, uh, episode interview on how to start exercising because a lot of people have fear to move, fear to exercise because every time they move, they hurt. So she did a wonderful three uh uh, we did a three episode, three week podcast uh, uh, on n- exercise. I also feel pelvic pain in women is so important. Interstitial cystitis, painful bladder, menstrual periods that are painful. It is really important for people, for women to understand that pain is not normal. So I, I invited a wonderful physical therapist who specializes in pelvic health, pelvic PT, to, to do an interview with me. Again, it was a, it was a long conversation and so needed because fibromyalgia affects, you know, not just the pain, but sexual health, intimacy, hugging hurts, you know. So I'm I'm bringing people in to augment my message, to augment my topics that I want to talk about. And I'm looking forward to looking for other 
people to come and I have I have I have great plans. I have I have I have a vision who I want to invite. I think it's gonna be very good for you know for the future episodes. I agree. And we'll be sharing and add all the descriptions. And so people can find the link and subscribe to the podcast moving forward. I mean, it, it's it's great content and the interviews I just shared uh, the pelvic interview information to someone that was in my coaching group, because that's what she was talking about. I was like, I have a great resource for you to listen to. Um, so it, it, they're wonderful interviews when it comes to having a podcast and an extra resource. And I do agree. Sometimes with reading, we were sending out books because we we just like to get people as many resources some people like to read other people like to listen they can walk while they listen or they can lay down and listen as far as learning that way too so i i love the approach yes and i also most of my interviews actually have full transcripts attached to the so they can actually read especially with my accent or if i speak too fast or if they want to take notes so every episode has in the show notes you can find actually a transcript to most of my to most of the episodes wonderful and then you're you're editing it yourself you built this podcast yourself right now well now i'm trying to shift it to to us my my son is uh, almost 16 and he has been editing some of my uh, episodes but you know he, yes right now i it's all me i'm doing it i'm writing it i'm producing it i'm publishing it i'm doing social media that's why i'm not doing a very good job with social media because i just don't have enough time in the day but yeah it's a you know when you have a passion it becomes easy uh just when i was a programmer and i was struggling with my jobs i really didn't like it you know you come to work later and later you come home earlier and earlier you know when you, i became a resident waking up at three in the morning going to see a patient in the hospital was not a big deal and now I find that waking up at four in the morning to record a podcast because it's the quietest time of the day. No one's barking, no, no kids are you know, going around. I, I, again, I get up and do it because you know, when you have the passion, you find the way and you find the, the resources you need, you find the time you need, and you just find the energy. So that's what I've been doing for the past almost eight months, nine months. I, I can see the passion resonating off of you. And one thing I always try to encourage people to do is don't be afraid of tech. Um, so just jumping in, figuring it out, trying to explore new ideas. So that that's cool because you've gotten into it. So you're doing things, recording, you're using all the technology and the recording system, Zoom or any of these applications to build what you need. And you're diving in. You may make mistakes, but you keep learning. And this is something that we encourage our patient advocates who have a podcast to do. Just keep on the drive. Just keep on trying new things. You know, it may not start like your first episode may not go viral role but you keep going and persevering and you keep adding you keep bringing new people in and new listeners exactly it took me a week to record my first episode i did so many trials and did so many so many so many edits it took me a week to record the first episode and each episode becomes easier and easier not just to produce but to 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 you know to read or to 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 record to edit even you know you you become quicker so the more you do things the best, better you become. What you practice makes you stronger. Exactly. I, I, I just enjoy, there's so multi levels to everything that you're sharing with us today and I appreciate it. I know you mentioned something which was actually really good insights for what is going on. So this referral from a rheumatologist for fibromyalgia patients, we've been seeing this across the country from rheumatologists. Like, what do you suggest as a best approach? Because I know there's some difficulties going on with, you, you mentioned there's a wait list. So acknowledging, like, I think people don't realize how long the wait list is, even for autoimmune conditions and getting people in there that, have a lot of complicated conditions, um, multi-levels, but what's your best advice for kind of managing a little bit of the referral to the primary care provider for fibromyalgia? You, you mean from the patient point of view, what, what the patient can do in terms of referral, getting, getting treated by, by, by the primary care physician? Yeah, from a patient perspective, because I think we've lost some of that communication or perspective of what's actually going on. Because as you mentioned, there's less rheumatologists, there's a lot of patients, there's a long wait list. And so it gets confusing for fibromyalgia patients when we go to a rheumatologist and then we get referred to, to back to the primary care. So when, when I refer patients to primary care, and uh, I just want to acknowledge primary care do a tremendous job in this day and age, managing very complex issues. We have more medications, we have more imaging, more testing. So primary care physicians are not the same primary care physicians that your grandmother had 50 or 60 years ago. 
and the bureaucracy of our healthcare system, regardless of where you live, live in the US or England or Canada, the bureaucracy is there as well. So they're seeing more patients in a shorter amount of time, they have to do more manual bureaucratic tasks, and then they have to see more complex patients that they now have more complex medications. You know, just diabetes alone, have like 20 new medications just came out on the market in the past five years. So when a patient comes to a primary care physician for myalgia, what primary care physician will do most likely is manage your medications first. Because if they prescribed you Cymbalta or Duloxetine or Gabapentin or Lyrica, they have to manage those medications, their refills, make sure they're safe to take, make sure you don't have side effects. So, uh, so be aware that part of your appointment will be checking in with you on your medications to make sure they're, you're still taking them or make sure the dose is appropriate and you don't have side effects. Then if you have other chronic conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, you know, if you have osteoporosis, whatever else going on, they have to manage that too. So medications, other health issues, your immunizations, preventative care, you know, mammograms, colonoscopies, vaccines. Now we have COVID, you know, what booster you get and when you get it and why you get it. So all those complex issues have to be addressed in addition to fibromyalgia. So when the fibromyalgia patient comes for a routine visit, it may not be the primary focus of the physician to talk about fibromyalgia. It will be all the other topics. So if you have a, a, a concern about fibromyalgia by itself, make a separate visit with that provider about fibromyalgia. It's, you will have routine visits, medication visits, but then have a concern visit about fibromyalgia, and they will have time to address your concerns about fibromyalgia. And bring agenda. I love for my patients bring agenda when they have questions, because it keeps us focused and keeps us on task and keeps us to make sure nothing is forgotten. Because oftentimes, you know, I'm I'm leaving the office, you know, the, the door is opened and there's one more question or, you know, have a shot in my knee, you know. And I know the burdens of financial, you know, the co-pays and the time of work and, you know, transportation, you know, it it, it burdens physicians to say, we'll see you next time about this. So having an agenda and make sure everything is addressed. And also, you know, for example, if you have a neck pain and you have this a new concern for you, make an appointment for neck pain so you can discuss this new symptom or a problem that's annoying to you or concerning to you that you can dedicate the you know 20, you know, 15, 20 minutes to that problem alone. So you can tell the story about your pain. So it's not an add-on to your vaccination and mammogram, but actually you talk about the pain and bring a story on a piece of paper. If you have brain fog, write down, my neck pain started two days ago, two weeks ago, two years ago, 30 years ago, when it does it hurt? Do I move my neck? It hurts, you know, it, it wakes me up from sleep. What are the what are, are concerning symptoms to you? How have you managed it? 20 years of pain versus two days of pain is different. Have you seen physical therapist? When did you see physical therapist? Was it helpful or not helpful? All those things, a physician has to rule out things can kill you, things can disable you, things are not you know, serious and just nuisance to physician, but not to you. You know, those things have to, you know, we have to be aware that our, our thinking process as physicians is different from the thinking process of a patient. You know, we want to make sure you're safe. That's not our number one concern, safety. We want to make sure you live a long life happily and, and without problems, you know, second concern, you know, those things. So your pain, if you have for 30 years, you have to give us more detail. So we don't have to order yet another x-ray or yet send you to another MRI. You know, we can just reassure you to make sure nothing is wrong or ask you for make sure there's no red flags about that pain and appropriately treat it either supportive care or massage or physical therapy, or you may need a new x-ray because it's been now 30 years of the same pain and you, never had, you haven't had an x-ray in 30 years or you know five years or 10 years. So bring details, write them down, you know, have an agenda and it will be a more productive visit for you and less fr frustrating visit for, for a physician. Does it make sense? It. Yes, it does. I mean, it's this sort of similar education that we're trying to do is like get yourself organized, bring it in because brain fog, you may not forget, you'll forget stuff. I mean, I do it all day. I forget. I have to write it down. Otherwise, you may be somewhere here and you're like, oh, wait, I forgot to address this or but the one topic element and then also 
the, some of these conditions too, like blood sugar regulation and managing and preventing and how that impacts like fibromyalgia, especially if you're crashing a lot or have energy regulation type issues is look or anemia, like those basic blood test values. Like we try to educate patients to understand too, that may be part of the process that you may have to work on with primary care as well. Yeah, ruling things out, ruling things in, evaluating that, you know, and putting things in context, you know, that's what physicians do. We train to to analyze a lot of data. And sometimes fibromyalgia is not data, it's more, more, more emotional symptoms. And, you know, and I, I refer a lot to psychiatry a lot because a lot of patients have, you know, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorders, mood disorders. Uh, almost all patients with fibromyalgia or majority of patients will have history of trauma, abuse, or some sort of adverse uh, life events. So those things, primary care physicians may not be able to help you with. You may need to go to some other uh, specialist like psychiatry, psychology, to, or, you know, coaching or physical therapy, or, you know, those providers will help you improve the quality of life. And I feel like you need to not negate that referral. You know, we're not telling you you're crazy because we're telling you, we're telling you, you know, go see, see psychologist or, or psychiatrist. It's important. Your mental health is just as important as your physical health. And when we refer patients to, for mental health evaluation or treatment, we're not telling you fibromyalgia is all in the head. We're not telling you that you're, 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 you're not, you know, thinking clearly. We know that part of your health is mental health and we're not equipped as physicians or primary care physicians to oftentimes to provide those services, but they will make a difference in if you have anxiety, depression, other other you know mental health issues, how you feel about your life, how you feel about your symptoms, how you feel about fibromyalgia, and it will actually improve your pain. We know that if you have more depression, anxiety, your 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 pain fear cycle kicks in, and you, your pain is amplified. So get referrals if you need it, and see specialists if you need it. But at the same time, be recognize that a lot of specialists a lot of specialty care, a lot of visits to doctors are also traumatizing. Yes, the, it's you know, stressful. It's stressful. So, you know, yes, it, it may be helpful to see yet another podiatrist or yet another orthopedist, but recognize it may be a trigger for your symptom flare and it not may, may be 100% necessary to do. So you have to kind of ju judge what you need and when you need it. Yeah, I mean, managing chronic illness in general can be stressful, especially if you're trying to maintain a job and you have to get work off like, or you like you mentioned early on family, but then you you need this time to actually go make doctor's appointments, then you're going to the doctor's appointments. And I appreciate telehealth because it made it a little bit easier. But still, it's like having these conversations, making sure you're organized, making sure you don't forget things. There's a lot of details to that. And taking care of your mental health is really important. That that's what helped me stay organized when I went to um, a psychotherapy and learning more of what I needed because this created so much of a spiral. Like I'm running around for a doctor, I can't, I can't manage it. Yes, and I, and I, you know, I think tele, telehealth and telemedicine, especially for psychiatry and psychology, because rheumatologists will have to touch people, will have yeah. to examine your, your your joints. But you know, I think. The telehealth has been great for psychotherapy in coaching and all the mental health um, specialties because they don't have to touch you. They can they have to talk to you and they can do it remotely. So you don't have to travel. There's no expenses. There's no time off work. You can actually go take a break in, in, you know, and have a visit. And it opened a lot more access to patients who would not do it otherwise. Which is really important. So I'm really hoping they keep yeah. all of that for mental health and just access to just general telehealth for people. So I, I'm really hoping we're advocating for it to continue. So we will definitely be pushing for that. Um, so what's next? I know you, you, you were mentioning you have a lot going on within even the fibromyalgia space or chronic illness conditions as well. What's next for you? As I was watching the workshops, um, what's on your plate? So I just announced yesterday at the end of my last workshop that I I'm introducing the new membership called Rheumomate as R H E U M Mate Rheumatology Mate. Uh, it is a friendly uh, mate that will help rheumatologists, I hope, or help rheumatology patients. So it it is a beta launch. I'm just starting it uh, as we speak. Is we're starting in uh, in October, and this is a membership to provide coaching and support. Uh, for patients who or people who have autoimmune conditions, chronic pain, and fibromyalgia. So this is not just for fibromyalgia patients. 
So you can have the tools to improve your pain, fatigue, exhaustion, overwhelm, and also uh, kind of help you regulate your nervous system if it's, if you're living in survival mode and to, to help you live with your goals and dreams and improve your quality of life. You know, I started this uh, this work last year. I really didn't have the, uh, plans to to change much about my life, but here we are doing this membership. I, a lot of patients and, and, and people who listen to my podcast email me and saying, this is great. This is fantastic opportunity. This is great information. I love it. I learned so much. And yet they don't apply that knowledge, even though this is like step by step. Okay. Eat better, you know, drink water, sleep better, move. You know, it's hard to apply knowledge when you have chronic pain, when you have children, when you have jobs, when you don't have enough time to rest. So I am creating this membership to help you get your goals aligned so I can teach you and give you lessons on material that you need to know and then actually spend a month practicing it, being, you know, uh, coaching you on the material, giving you the support you need, answering your questions. Because I know that passive learning is passive learning. We'll all love to learn. You know, you listen to podcasts, it's fascinating, it's interesting. We love the information, but it, when it comes to application and implementation, it's hard. We probably you probably bought many books on self improvement. You know, I have or weight loss. I have, but it's it's hard to go from wanting to change to actually changing or doing things to change. You know, January first we start a diet or, or or lose weight, sign up for gym membership. You know, and then or buy a treadmill. And January fifteenth we have a clothes hanger. You know, on the treadmill, and we have never gone to the gym in the you know past two years. You know, this happens to people who don't have fibromyalgia or chronic illness. But if you have fibromyalgia, it's even more difficult to manage. Your intentions are there. You want to do it, but you wake up in a brain fog or pain or you have a flare. And all your good intentions got got sideways because you have to manage your pain. And when you have pain, your brain says it's danger. You have to survive. Focus on pain. How can you focus on anything else if you have pain or discomfort? You can't. So I want to bring the tools that you can actually recognize the pain is not always real in terms of real uh, as, a, as a damage to your joints, maybe pain that comes from your from your brain, how your brain processes pain, because fibromyalgia is a pain processing disorder. And then if you know that, you can have different exercises and different things like meditation to augment that, that pain so you can function better. And then I also want to teach you how to eat better, how to drink water, how to move a little bit better. And then we're also going to have yoga sessions and meditation sessions every week. It's going to be either live or recorded because a lot of patients want to do yoga or they want to do exercise and they're afraid to move. They're afraid to start. They're afraid to, because they know I move, I hurt. So the brain doesn't want to hurt, right? You don't want to have any more pain. So you stop doing exercises. So a friend of mine who uh, is helping me uh, with lessons, I don't do yoga, I don't, I, I don't, I don't pretend to be a yoga teacher. So she's going she gonna to do a very simple introductory yoga uh, in a chair initially. So you are, just know what is yoga, how yoga can help. Mayo Clinic study shows that 30 minutes of yoga a day dramatically improves pain, fatigue, exhaustion, and improves your sleep. So why not do 30 minutes a day? I mean, we all have 30 minutes we can find to do something. So you know, chair yoga, stretching, meditation, we can incorporate it to our daily life and you will see a benefit very quickly. And then, you know, I also want to uh, have challenges in uh, accountability. So you can have, you know, a 30 day challenge to drink more water, a 30 day challenge to stop sugar. And then I want to, I want to have a community where you can have the accountability pods or partners or groups that you can share that those wins with each other. What I see a lot on Facebook uh, groups is a lot of complaining, a lot of complaining about doctors, medications, our life, our pain, our symptoms. And I want I, I want to have less drama and more accountability and more support so you can come with the problem and we can find you a solution versus just complain about it. Uh, I want to have positivity, less drama and, you know, and people who want to help you. Because I feel like uh, your nervous system needs to co-regulate with others, right? This is my last workshop. You, we need humans and animals in our lives to feel better from a nervous uh, point of view, nervous system point of view. So when we have patient, uh, other people who can co-regulate with you to improve your symptoms, who have the same agenda, who have the same drive, who have the same need, it will be beautiful. I feel like it's going to be a great community to grow and to, um, to produce results. Uh, and that's what I'm looking forward to to building it. 
Oh, I look forward to hearing more. And it, it's launched, correct? It's so launched. people can it's start a, to yeah. register right now. Okay, yes. perfect. We'll yeah, include I'm, those links. Yes, thank you. And I'm actually offering a new a special for this launch because I don't know. I'm not sure when I'm going to have the next opening because I'm just building it on the fly, uh, juggling again too many things. But uh, right now I'm offering a special if you, because I want to build as big community as possible because it's really much more fun to have a coaching group that you can coach, not just one person or, you know, multiple people and also have the accountability and, you know, and the community to, to help you succeed. So the more people will have the merrier. So we're having a special right now. I'm having a special right now. If you sign up now and you bring a friend, both of you will have 50% off. You can bring as many people as you want, but you'll have 50% off a discount for life. And you get locked in an in rate for the rest of your uh, our membership as long as membership is there and you're a member and it's not tied to another person so if you if you if he quits or she quits you can still have the discount but i just want to bring more people so they can join now and share that experience as i'm building up and the benefits of being a, the founder of this new program is i get your feedback if it doesn't work i can change it you know, I'm not having gazillion people in my membership. If I, I will have an intimate group, hopefully, that we can hear your feedback and change things, add things. And as we grow, we can have more resources and, and more opportunities, more coaches, more, more uh, exercise groups, or whatever. But I want to make it more uh, patient person centered. You know, I, I want to have this as a support to you and kind of up, 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 unload this burden from the primary care rheumatologist who's helping you so they can focus on your medication. So can, they can focus on your, you know, preventive medicines and diabetes, high blood pressure. This is be the mate to them. You know, the, the, the captain of the ship is your rheumatologist or your primary care doctor. I'm the first mate. I'm just there to support them. So this is going to be the, the helper community to help you do things that you want your primary care to help you with, but they can't. They don't have the time, the energy or the knowledge to do. So this is going to be on educating you what what conditions are you know uh, chronic pain management you know in terms of uh, meditation pain, pain reprocessing cognitive behavior therapy coaching and diet support nutrition support sleep support so you can have actually meaningful changes to your life and stop living in the survival exhaustion all the time and actually build the life you want so that's oh. my goal. Wonderful. It's a, big, it's a big dream. It's a bit, I don't know how, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dream and we'll see how, it, I hope it comes into reality. Well, the goal, I mean, there's so much to group work together and the accountability you're, you're encouraging the accountability partner. So you have people working together, which is fantastic. And then improving quality of life. Because we want, whether you have an autoimmune condition or another chronic illness condition, like we're improving quality of life. So that's what makes a difference. And then we're doing it together in a patient-centered environment. I love with led by education, um, by a wonderful caring provider, and then they work together. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited and I hope I have the energy and the knowledge to build it. And I hope I have, you know, what it takes to do it. Well, you have our support fibro community to rally behind you, so we're going to send you. you a lot of successful energy. I appreciate your time today joining us, and I'm super excited that you'll be joining us too for the the conference coming up. We we went, we decided to go big. We have done different mini conferences before, but this is the largest ever of bringing the community together. So other healthcare providers will be on the main stage, and we have some researchers. I'm waiting for a little bit. I'm trying to dial in some good neuroinflammation researchers, and then of course our community leaders. So we'll have a lot of support group leaders, bloggers, vloggers, other podcasters. So maybe you can connect with them too from the, they can cross and have you in, uh, do an interview with you as well. But um, thank you so much well, for your time today. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to the conference. I'm so looking forward to sharing my knowledge and uh, thank you for your time and thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. Well, I know this is not the last presentation we're going to have from you. So there's a lot here. I love the science background and I know that you dig into the science. So yes. our support fibro friends love it. I know they've even told me like, okay, you can break it down, but break it down in small chunks and make it attainable for other people. So we're going to have a lot of fun in 2023 too. Yes. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Bye support fibro Thank you. friends. Thank you so much.